in a certain city, a politician was running for office and he advertised for volunteer workers. There were so many young women appeared for the job as volunteers that there was a near riot. Were they interested in politics? No, the first question they asked was, how many men have appeared? <laughs> they were part of the lonely young women of this great city. And then I know of an old woman who stays up every night until 12 o'clock to hear the announcer say, we are now signing off, good night, and have a good sleep. <laughs> that relieves her of her loneliness. There was really and truly a woman wrote to me and told me that uh, my program was the only one to which her cat ever listened. <laughs> So our subject tonight has to do, to some extent, with loneliness. It affects all ages. Uh, children are lonely, five million of them belong to divorced parents in this country. Boys get lonely. That's why they join gangs. Because they get power which they do not individually have. Young girls are lonely when they get a pimple on the nose. Older girls are more lonely still when the boy treats them as a glass, throws the glass aside after he has taken the drink. They find then that they're just a replaceable part in the great erotic IBM machine. Their loneliness increases. Then there's the loneliness of leadership. Being the top man on the totem pole. There's the loneliness of being the bottom, at the bottom of the totem pole, because you're just one of the masses. And you're apt to lose your personality. The loneliness sometimes of, of marriage. where all the jokes have been told. There's no new event to narrate. And it's the terrible solitude of being alone together. And then even when it does remain fine and noble and rich, even in moments of greatest unity, there is a feeling of apartness after such an ecstasy. One hopes to completely submerge oneself, and yet one finds oneself back again. The hypochondriacs, of course, are lonely. And so we were asked to talk on this program about this subject of loneliness. And I'm going to give, after these facts, which we have just narrated, I'm going to give first the causes and then I'm going to suggest some remedies. Now, I didn't know whether to use the blackboard or not. My angel is here and uh, I cannot think of any diagram that I could use. Just write causes on the board. So I'm afraid I will not be able to use my angel, but uh, just before I came on the program, he wanted to know if I would play a game of golf with him tomorrow. And I told him that I was not old enough for golf because I play tennis twice a week. <laughs> when I get old, I am going to play golf and I'm going to have a wagon too to take me around from hole to hole. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, he was telling me that the other day he was, he was playing golf and he drove off 225 yard hole it was and the ball went right into the cup and he looked up to heaven and he said dear lord let me do this by myself <laughs> he's not a lonely angel as you see <laughs> now 
Now, what are the causes of loneliness? Well, one of the causes of loneliness has to do, first of all, with the lonely people themselves. And another reason why they are lonely is because of people who are not lonely. First of all, on account of the lonely themselves. They want to be loved too much. They want to love, to be loved. Now, there's nothing wrong about wanting to be loved because we're all Stradivarius violins without bows. I didn't mean that pun. We are... <laughs> One of the difficulties of an unprepared, unscripted play. And uh, we're cups without saucers. We, we, we are to be complimented. But the deep loneliness of which we are speaking comes from an excessive desire to be loved. The more I want to be loved, the less I am loved. The less I'm loved, the less lovable I become. The less lovable I become, the less I am capable of loving others. And that's how by a desire to seek only oneself and to please oneself, one gets caught like a bird in a fowler's net. And the more one struggles to get out of this loneliness, the more one is captured by it. Just take some concrete examples of this desire to be loved. I know of a mother whose daughter was away at college. And she used to call up the daughter every night. Would keep the daughter on the phone for an hour. And protested to the daughter that she was not appreciated as she should be. And because other girls in this college wanted to use the phone, she said to her mother, Mother, I'm forbidden to use the phone anymore. One day, the superintendent had sent for her, and she was unable to answer the phone, and she told her mother, send someone to answer the phone for her. The mother said, this is the end, and she refused to see her daughter again. Thus, by wanting too much to be loved without loving, one loses even the love that one seeks. And then, there was a fiancé. She used to. I wonder if any of you young women in the audience ever do that. Do you know what she would do? She would write down in a book every time the boyfriend called, how long he spoke. She also wrote down how often he wrote and how many words he wrote in each letter. She felt that she wasn't loved enough, so she began writing herself anonymous letters, threatening her. And she said that these letters came from a well-known author in the city. And finally, she was exposed by this man whom she blamed, and eventually the marriage was broken off. She just loved too much, loved to be loved. And then there was the, the, uh, the wife who felt that her husband was paying no attention to her, insisted that he stay away from work. She wanted to go to a picnic, wanted to go to the beach, and he found excuses many times and finally lost his job. The marriage broke up. So one of the principal reasons of loneliness, therefore, is this egotism which seeks only oneself. And you can already see the, the cure anticipated by the mere fact that we mention this cause. But then there's another cause of loneliness, and that's the part on the part of the people who are not lonely. 
they do not bring any love to these people. Do you know what we should do? We should really concentrate a great deal on certain types of people. We should concentrate on, on the unfortunate, on the poor, on the socially disinherited, on the unloved, particularly the unloved, and on the ugly. And we, we bring love to them. We put love into them. Then they become lovable. Now, for example, you are very lovable to God. Did you know that? You say, well, what is there in me to love? Nothing. But he put his love into you. That's why you're lovable. And that's what we have to do with other people. And so the loneliness of these people is increased also because the rest of us will not listen to them. Listening is a therapeutic. There was a psychologist who formulated a marriage case that involved uh, sexual, financial, social, and legal complications. He went to 100 clergymen and 100 priests to present the story, and he carried the stopwatch with him. Do you know how long they listened? The average was two and a half minutes. Then off the cuff answer. They refused to listen. They refused to care. Uh, George Bernard Shaw has something rather good on that subject. In his place on St. Joan, King Charles says to Joan, why do not the voices come to me? I am the king. And Joan answers, they do come to you, but you do not hear them. You have not sat in the field in the evening listening for them. If you prayed from the bottom of your heart and listened to the thrilling of the bells and the trilling of them after they had stopped ringing, you would hear the voices, just as I do. In other words, listening is a therapeutic, a cure for lonely people. We do the same thing with our prayers. We wouldn't do to a, uh, to a doctor what we do to God. We, would we go into a doctor and rumble, mumble off uh, all of our symptoms and then say, bye, doctor? Not listen. So listening on our part, refusal to listen, is one of the causes that intensifies this forsakenness. Now, what is a cure? Well, there are several cures, and we will just have time to mention one that is very important, namely caring for other people. When we're lonely, go out and serve. Then loneliness goes out through our fingertips. Our heart opens. The Chinese have a proverb, if you're without shoes, go out and find a man without any feet. Caring for others. I remember when I first went to, went to Europe to study, to do my university work as a young priest, the first Christmas I was lonely. I was really lonesome. I think it was the only time in my life I was lonesome. What would I do? So I went to someone in the city of Louvain and asked for a list of the worthy poor. And I went to this particular alley. 
It was the wrong address, actually. I got into Rat Alley. And when the door opened, there, earthen floor, was a blind father at a stove. Ten children barefooted around the stove. A ladder leading up to the second floor. One bed upstairs, bed downstairs. The children slept crosswise. I asked the family what they had. This was Christmas Eve, what they had for, for dinner, and she opened a bag of straw. The children had no sabots, no wooden shoes. I took care of them for four years while I was studying at the university. Got them jobs. Rehabilitated them. I felt at times perhaps they were drawing on me. But do you know that the day that I went up for my examination as a professor at that university, that I went in at 9 o'clock to face 200 professors. I saw the whole family coming down the street. I asked them where they had been. They said, for the last two days, we've been at a shrine praying for you that you would pass the examination. We walked all the way back. I was never lonesome again. That's the cure. Helping the neighbor. But here's something to remember, too. We think we should not be lonely. In this age of psychiatry, there are two or three conclusions that our world has drawn which are false. One is that we should never have a tension. Certainly we have tensions. We must have them. We've got body and spirit, and they go in opposite directions. They have two different landing fields. Certain tensions are normal. If we didn't have them, we would be abnormal. And then, we're lonesome. Sure, there's a metaphysical loneliness Perfection is not here. This is not our home. I've got something that I want in my heart that nothing on this earth can satisfy, and nothing can satisfy you either. And we know it very well. So what's, this, what's the cause of this loneliness? What are we looking for? Well, we say we're looking for God. Yes. But then I know what you will answer. What does God know about loneliness? Now, that's a good question. That's a good question. What does he know about loneliness? Does he know anything about the loneliness, for example, of a babe in Afghanistan who has no better home than just straw? Does God know anything about the loneliness of a mother who has to gather up a child in order to escape a dictator and fly halfway across Africa? Does God know anything about the loneliness of a man that's born on the wrong side of the tracks? Who's isolated socially from people simply because his hands are calloused with common labor and is denied decent society? Sure, does God know anything about that kind of loneliness, for example, in which one is expelled from a city, disowned by one's own people, does he know anything about the loneliness of being deserted by friends? Does he even know anything about the loneliness of feeling doubts, doubts even about religion, doubts even which one cries out, why hast thou abandoned me? Does God know anything about these things? Yes, those are good questions. Now suppose that there was a figure that came into all of this loneliness and so immersed himself in it that he would not immunize himself from it, would not cut himself off from it. Would you, for example, be the only one on the battlefield that was whole and not help any of the wounded? And so if there was a figure that came into this world of ours and refused to isolate himself from loneliness and felt it so much that blood poured out from his body, felt loneliness so much but as if all the robberies of the world were thrust into his hands, as if he himself were guilty. 
that felt all loathsome carnality so much that his flesh was hanging from him like purple rags. Suppose someone came into this world and went into all of this loneliness, took it all, and was not overcome by it, but conquered it all. Then what? Then I may be lonely every now and then, but I'll not be overcome by it. Then I have a captain, kind of a captain, who did press it not a button in heaven from a celestial command. But I have a captain who stumbled to a throne. Bishop Sheen will return in a moment. Uh, did that uh, telecast seem a little short to you? Actually, I was just informed that we were one minute short. Now, I have a clock before me over there, and I keep my eyes on it. But this clock here was right. I finished three seconds before the time. <laughs> but up in the control room, that celestial command that I just talked about, they figured it wrong by one minute. So they asked me if I could, instead of coming out for a very brief closing, closing, come on and talk to you for a minute and a half. <laughs> now, you are put to the test. If that telecast seemed very short, you are enjoying it. We would say time passed like anything. If you were not enjoying it, it seemed very, very long. As a matter of fact, this minute and a half will seem interminable to you. Now, I want to tell you, I want to tell you, my good people, that I have to leave you now. Are you a bit lonely? I am. I'm lonely too. Bye now and God love you. Fulton J. Sheen is indeed a man for all seasons. He walked a paced beat, allowing us to glimpse his nature and ponder its worth and to enjoy its presence. Bishop Sheen authored over 90 books. He broadcast countless radio and television programs and ministered in many parts of the world to people of every belief. As he said many times, it is not a unity of religion we plead for, but a unity of religious people. We may not be able to meet in the same pew, but we can meet on our knees. The bishop wrote 94 books, recorded countless radio shows, and appeared on hundreds of network and syndicated television programs. His legacy is a treasure of joy that transcends time and helps us to believe that truly life is worth living. <laughs>